Hey guys, we hope you enjoy this free clip of Aggressive Progressives on the Young Turks. This is just a preview of what you will receive with TYT membership. That means exclusive interviews, panel discussions, and more of Jimmy, and of course, me. Check out this next clip, and if you like what you see, you can access full episodes of Aggressive Progressives by becoming a member. Head to tyt.com slash join now. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Aggressive Progressives. I'm here with Rod Blacone and Steph Zamorano. Hello. And um, right now I wanna go over Venezuela, what's happening in Venezuela, and we're gonna bring in our guests in just a second. Um, but, if, but people don't know what's happening in Venezuela because they watch the news. Um, and that's everywhere, right? So just about everywhere is getting the news wrong. And um, just like the Iraq war and uh, Libya and, and Syria, they, just like that, they get it, most of it wrong. So um, so this is a slow coup, and this guy, Juan Guaido, uh, swore himself in as the president of the country. He wasn't elected. So let's go to this article real quickly. This will, this will uh, help clear it up. Uh, until last week, fewer than 20% of Venezuelans even knew who Guaido was, the guy who says he's now president. Last week, 20% of the country, he, they were the only ones who knew who he was. And he only came to head the opposition-controlled National Assembly by accident. To quell chronic infighting, Venezuela's fragmented opposition agreed to rotate leadership. And despite claiming only 14 seats of 160, it was the turn of his party, popular will. For his part, Maduro was just inaugurated for his second term after winning an election that the main opposition coalition chose to boycott. Today, they cry fraud, but this is an opposition that has been boycotting elections, orchestrating coups, and unleashing bloody violence in the streets of Venezuela for nearly two decades. The opposition has been doing that, not Maduro. We should be clear, Guaido's self-declaration is yet another attempted coup. It doesn't take a legal scholar to know that it has no constitutional basis. The opposition appeals to Article 233 of the Constitution to claim that Maduro has, quote, abandoned the presidency. But he clearly hasn't abandoned the presidency. On Venezuela, Democratic Party leaders are often hard to distinguish from their Republican counterpoints. And today is no exception. Eyes trained on Florida's 2020 electoral college votes, most, like Nancy Pelosi, have staked out openly pro-coup positions. And after two years stoking anti-Russia panic, MSNBC's standard script offers little guidance to confuse liberals seeking to triangulate political positions. Trump is for the coup, but Russia is against it? What are we supposed to do? It's not clear what the coming days will bring. Guaido has so far refrained from calling for a new election. His strategy has rather been to build a parallel government, not with popular votes, but with international support. The Bank of England is currently under pressure to refuse the Maduro government's longstanding request to repatriate Venezuelan gold. So they're stealing their money. Meanwhile, if there was any question about the role of oil in this equation, Marco Rubio has tweeted about how U.S. oil jobs demand that the coup succeed. And Guaido is threatening to name a parallel board to Venezuelan-owned but U.S.-based oil company, Citgo. Lost amid all this global brinkmanship, however, are the very people that everyone claims to be speaking for, the Venezuelan poor. Those bearing the brunt of a profound economic crisis, opposition sabotage, and U.S. sanctions alike. These very same sectors <coughs> rebelled against the crisis and neoliberal reform in 1989, propelling Hugo Chavez into power a decade later. And many are understandably unwilling to throw away the political gains of the past 20 years. And it is with these sectors, not with the right-wing imperialist coups, that Venezuela's future lay. So no matter how you feel about Venezuela, the coup is the exact wrong way to go. And that throws away 20 years of socialist gains inside that country. And uh, right now I wanna bring on our guest, Max Blumenthal. He's the editor of The Gray Zone Project, as well as an award-winning journalist and author of several books, including the best-selling Republican Gomorrah, Goliath, The 51-Day War, and The Management of Savagery. He recently went to Capitol Hill to ask members of Congress where they stood on the Venezuelan coup, and he got some enlightening responses. Let's say, hey, Max, are you there? Welcome to the show. Great to be on, Jimmy. Thanks for having us. Now, I'm gonna play your video in just a second. And uh, is there anything you wanna add about the background information on Venezuela that I might have left out? Well, I think that was fantastic background. And you know, the only thing I would wanna add is that in recent days, uh, Carlos Vecchio, who's the new kind of Trump imposed charge d'affaires here in Washington, and Juan Guaido himself has have said that they will 
privatize the state oil company and basically sell off its assets uh, to the highest bidder from Chevron and Halliburton and whoever else wants to make a quick buck in Venezuela. They're openly saying that. And Marco Rubio and John Bolton have also said that this uh, is a great opportunity for foreign oil investors if we can just get this uh, elected government out of there. Now, now, Max, I don't know. I mean, you follow this stuff a lot closely, closer than I do, especially a lot longer than I have. Are, are, are you so a little surprised at how it's the exact same script over and over and over that it goes from, uh, hey, Saddam's a bad guy, he oppresses his people, we have to invade him. Uh, Gaddafi's a bad guy, he oppresses his people, we have, hey, Assad's a bad guy. Now they're doing the exact same thing. Is, is it surprising to you how transparent it is? I, I remember at least that they tried to, um, you know, through the Office of Special Plans and Dick Cheney's little Potemkin village inside the Pentagon. Uh, they tried to sort of fabricate a pretext for invading Iraq, whereby Saddam Hussein posed a national security threat to the US because they claimed that he was working with Al Qaeda, although it was quite the opposite scenario, and that he had weapons of mass destruction. But in this case, no one's even claiming that Venezuela poses any kind of national security threat to the United States. Although there will be a national security situation if the country is completely destabilized and the refugee situation gets even worse. Um, you know, it'll be another case of the U.S. basically manufacturing a, a refugee crisis. Well, I just had a curtain fall down, so I'm gonna look even whiter than I am. No, go ahead, take a moment, and I'll I'll just uh, I'll play your video right now. How about that? So Max Blumenthal actually went to Congress. And he wanted to ask, so because the big problem everybody has with Russia and Trump and Wicked is they meddled in our politics. They meddled in our election. They are meddling in our country. So Max went to Congress and uh, he asked a lot of those people what they thought. And I'll play the video for you right now. Here we go. Do, do you think the U.S. is meddling in Venezuela? I don't think so. I mean, we're, we're the superpower in the world. Part of the Russian agenda is to undermine democracy, not just in our country, but in other countries as well. Do you think it would be uh, meddling if Russia were to declare uh, Nancy Pelosi the president of the US? <laughs> I haven't thought about that. She's not president of the United States, I'll tell you that. It's a pretty desperate situation over there, yeah. So we should be meddling. Um, you know, the problem is when you meddle, you cause uh, locals to rebel against that. So uh, it's a tough call. Maduro's troops or goons went into the ghetto and decided they were going to take over. Isn't he the president of the country? I mean, yeah. Are those are his security forces. Well, so perhaps. Do you think the U.S. is meddling in Venezuela? Are they meddling? Um, yeah, both both sides are meddling. But it's good meddling is what you're saying. Like I don't we should know if meddle. it's good meddling or not. I mean, any comment on the situation in Venezuela? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, as far as Venezuela is concerned, I think they did have a coup down there. Yeah. So, but what I'd like to see, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I got to go. It is a coup. It, 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 to me, when you have something like that happen, I think we got to do something about it, but I'm so sorry. I got to go. Okay, thanks. So, you know, I, I, it's really not my portfolio. The fact is, is that Venezuelans are starving today in an oil rich country. So, do you support the sanctions? Do you support the sanctions, which will hurt ordinary people? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to take the bait. Okay, do you support friend. the sanctions? I'm, I'm done. Adios. Do you support the sanctions? Adios. Would, I guess I support the sanctions. Wouldn't that hurt ordinary people? Hurt I, ordinary think, people? I think we need sometimes to demonstrate that uh, Mr. Maduro has hurt ordinary people every single day. By sanctioning the entire country. Only seizing his assets? Let me, let me say this about U.S. relationships in Central and South America and yeah. the Caribbean. Yeah. It is something that we should not be proud of. I mean, I look at the way uh, this country has treated hate, Haiti, Haiti for over 200 Aristide years. Aristide was an ally of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Jean Bertrand Aristide. Do you see this as a continuation of that policy of kind of neo-colonialism? Oh, for sure. Even with Cuba. 
Yeah. We've had an embargo on Cuba since 1959. This right. is tragic. Right. So do you and, think we should be embargo? And they are 90 Venezuela? miles off our coast. So. Right. So should we embargo Venezuela at the same Absolutely way? Absolutely and... not. Right. Why? Because then the population will suffer right. more. Right. Right. No, I don't agree with that. So are you going to speak up on that? Because you clearly know sir, what time Sir, that's is. not my issue. Okay. My okay. issue is financial service. All right. That's what I do. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Coup not a part of his financial business. I guess it's not. So the only guy in that whole video who got this right uh, refuses to speak up about it, and he has power. So back to you, Max. Max, uh, how's everything going with your shade? Great, great. With the curtain situations handled, operation uh, okay. curtain restoration is complete. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that um, was that was now pretty uh, depressing for, stuff. So huh? first of all, how come they didn't <laughs> kick you out of there? Because it's the people's house. I mean. I'm allowed to be there, but I did have several uh, staffers run back to me and try to get my details. I don't know if they were going to relay it to uh, you know whoever is in charge of the press and on Capitol Hill. But you know you can walk up in there with a camera and ask people questions in the hallways. And, uh, you can we, get- and, and were you surprised at anybody's response? Honestly, I wasn't. Uh, those were the responses I expected. You know, they range from ignorant to sociopathic. And uh, you know, I also wasn't surprised that Alexandria Ocasio Cortez ran away from me because she is terrified of being connected in any way to what's happening in Venezuela. Since she's declared herself a socialist, she wants to be identified more with like Norwegian socialism than you know socialism in the global south. And so, so you think she feels like it's it's too big of a it's too hard of a slog to tell the truth about Venezuela and get people informed on what's actually happening. So she'd rather just sidestep that issue and fight on other fronts. Is that what you think what she's doing? Yeah, that statement that she said that they're working on is never going to come out. I mean, I would be shocked if it came out. She wants to sidestep this one and focus on the Green New Deal or whatever else she's trying to do. And it's actually kind of dismaying because five members of Congress, including Ilhan Omar, who's a a freshman member of Congress, have spoken up and taken a lot of hits for speaking up against what should be an obvious, uh, it should be obvious, like we should not intervene in another country. Um, so it's whatever just, you think of the leadership, uh, she would have been able to give them a lot of cover if she had stood up on it. I know and she would have been able to mobilize a lot of resistance, but it's clear that she has ambitions uh, beyond just being kind of representing some district in New York. Oh, so that that's what you think that is? I mean, she clearly has some kind of national ambition, and she doesn't want to compromise the celebrity that she has right now. It seems obvious. I mean, the Progressive Caucus in Congress put out a letter simply condemning U.S. intervention, meaning like a military invasion, um, and they could only get four signatures. That's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. By, by the way, I read that letter. Did you read it? Yeah, I read it. It was one of those. It was very both sidesy, you know, and it was like. You know, a lot like Bernie's Bernie. Yeah, tweet. so Bernie like, tweeted out the same thing. Like, and, and what I try to tell The girl is the spawn of Satan. He is very bad. He's evil. However, <laughs> we should not do what we did in Chile in 1973. Yeah. And it's like, you know, come on. But but, but, but but fine, you know, fine. At least you said something. And I'm willing to accept that over silence. Yeah, yeah. So so that so again, we all so the best we can hope for from our most progressive politicians is a half measure. That actually, right. actually what he actually did in the, his statement, and I would be interested to hear if you agree with me, is that I think that when people like 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 Bernie and the Progressive Caucus say what they said. So with, just so just to be clear what they did was they came out and denounced and said we shouldn't intervene in Venezuela, which is great. But what they did to get before they did that, they first repeated CIA talking points and propaganda that justifies the reason to intervene in Venezuela. So they right. so they what they're doing is they're saying, oh sure, Trump is right. Everything they're saying is right. And it's horrible and Maduro and blah, blah, blah. But I just disagree on if we should try to help people or not. That's the well, worst argument in, in the world. So what you're actually doing is you're bolstering the the you're up the Trump. You're bolstering the people who want to intervene again. It's just like right. if you went, oh, yeah, Saddam's a bad guy. Saddam's got rape rooms. Saddam's gassing his own people. But I don't think we should go in. Well, you sound like a monster if you say you don't think we should go in, if you agree with all that stuff. And so when you first have to agree with all that stuff to say we shouldn't intervene, you're actually doing more harm than good, aren't you? 
Well, it also justifies the economic attack on Venezuela, which is really the heart of the Trump administration's policy to produce regime change. And what they're trying to do right now, in addition to seizing something like $17 billion in assets, and preventing the Bank of England from returning $1.3 billion in gold assets that is the property of the Venezuelan government is to prevent Venezuela from even exporting its own oil. And the goal is to basically starve the population and prevent the government from being able to pay the military and generate a military revolt. And so when you go down the road of saying Maduro is illegitimate, which he's actually not if you look at what took place in the 2018 elections. Uh, you go down the road of saying he's an evil dictator, which he's not, his popularity is actually higher than most of the figures in the right wing Latin American Lima group and it's on par with Emmanuel Macron's. Uh, then you basically make the case for sanctions and make the case for the regime change policy of the Trump administration while saying you're against it. So yeah, it's a pretty, idiotic rhetorical tactic, but it's one that we see from a lot of self-serving figures who are more concerned about their own image than the actual outcomes in the world. Uh, I, that's a point that's that's being lost on a lot of people. Uh, pe pe people don't, they think that that's the, the grown up thing to do is to first repeat some CIA propaganda about Venezuela. And then we'll have a discussion, even though now the playing field is completely tilted in favor of uh, in, intervention, right? Because right. If, if I agree to all your BS pre, preconditions, that means we should go in or else maybe I'm some kind of a monster. I don't wanna help those people in Venezuela. So again, that, I, I did a video about it and I caught a lot of flack because uh, why are you criticizing Bernie? He's getting it right. He's actually propping up the opposition. He's actually propping up the people who are doing the wrong thing in Venezuela, that, uh, even though he doesn't want to. Okay. Well, Even I, I also wonder, like, why why don't we ever talk about who the opposition is and who would come into power? Right. It's something that we never talked about with Libya and uh, the Libyan or Islamic Syria. Fight. They never or you know, Syria if, and you, basically now Al Qaeda literally controls an entire province of Syria, which is the last opposition held territory. We never talked about that. So who are the, who is the opposition in Venezuela? Uh, I did a piece with Dan Cohen at the Gray Zone Project, which is an investigation into Juan Guaido's background. And you know, I could talk for the next hour about it, but one thing we found is that he's been directly involved in street violence, uh, in actual destabilization activities, and he's boasted about it. Every violent destabilization campaign since 2007, Juan Guaido and his crew have been at the center of it, and they're actually not very popular in Venezuela as a result. So. Did you ask any of the Democrats who are supporting the coup why they would be aligning themselves with Donald Trump and how they feel about aligning themselves with Donald Trump on foreign policy? That would have been a great question to ask if they hadn't pretty much all ran away from me after <laughs> a few seconds. I mean, it was it was it was really uh, I started to wonder, like, is it me? Is it something about me? Like, do I smell bad? <laughs> um, but they say, I don't know. Like their staff would just drag them away. Um, it, it's like when you know it's Showtime at the Apollo when someone does really poorly and they bring out the Sandman. Um, so the staff would just drag him down the hall. And I got one guy, uh, Lacey Clay, who you saw at the end, yes. who was a member of Congress who was kind of woke because he was a member of the Black Congressional Caucus and they actually made a stand. The veteran Black Congressional Caucus members can remember when they stood up against the coup against Jean Bertrand Aristide, um, I think it was 1993 when he was removed and they put in power the School of the Americas, ah. right wing thugs. And members of the Black Congressional Caucus actually chained themselves to the White House gate to protest it. And Bill Clinton agreed to put Aristide back in. It's like, okay, uh, I agree with you, I'll, I'll, I'll end the coup. It shows how much power the US had. Um, and they actually made Aristide sign all these free trade agreements that doomed him in the end uh, in order to come back in. But so he was he he summoned that memory of when he stood up against our policy in Latin America. But then at the end of the day, financial services was uh, the only thing he cared about. So he wasn't going to raise his voice against this one, and well, that that pretty much said it all. But but yeah, I mean on on to your on your question. Nancy Pelosi has joined up uh, with the uh, death squad right of Elliot Abrams on Venezuela, and it shows where the real priorities are. John Bolton, for Christ, I mean, it's- John Bolton, I mean, this guy was considered a maniac uh, 
Uh, in the Bush during the Bush era, he was considered like anathema among Democrats, and now you can see him getting a lot of positive press. People, I, I remember reading news reports of normal, regular people booing him when they would see him in public. That's yeah. that's how bad Jack Bolton is. And there we are, Nancy Pelosi going right along with him. And it was nice to see all the progressives who supported Nancy Pelosi for speaker, wasn't it? Yeah, including Ocasio Cortez. So what I mean, do you make, so what do you make of it, Max? What do you make of our electoral chances of ever having a government that represents the people? I mean, right here in the United States, because we know we live in an oligarchy, and the big hope was that people were going to upset the apple cart, Ocasio Cortez, Rokana, and it, it, and it looked great. But now here we are. We're back to the status quo again. And and do you have any hope for electoral politics turning our country uh, even a little bit progressive? Well, I, th I think they're definitely, if you look at the base, the Democratic Party, if you look at where voters are, and if you talk to people who just simply don't vote, uh, I find a lot of agreement there. I find there's a pretty strong consensus against war and endless interventions. Um, so the, you know, the issue is obviously the elites in the beltway and the neocon neoliberal consensus. Um, and so I think it's important to mobilize behind uh, candidates in this campaign who are going to open up the parameters of debate on permanent war and issues that are that the mainstream media has said we simply can't talk about. I think that's the real third rail in American politics is when you talk about empire, when you talk about permanent war, and you talk about the the way that the national security state is actually meddling in our media. And one candidate who's done that, and I've stood up for her uh, from the beginning of her candidacy, was Tulsi Gabbard. Um, and there was a clear attempt to define her in the eyes of the left as someone who can't be supported. And it was it really reminded me of the disinformation campaigns that have come out of Russia Gate. And it's been pretty clear uh, from her statements since since she's been declaring her since she declared her candidacy that she is a serious anti-war candidate who poses a real threat to the national security state and its agenda. And so I think it's important, even though she might just get 2% of the vote, to support a protest campaign like that because it could move someone like Bernie or Elizabeth Warren in a general election if we demonstrate at the grassroots that this issue does matter to us and that no matter how much CNN and MSNBC uh, wanna have every you know form, they basically have like a retirement club from Langley on air no all day. Kidding. I know. Uh, no matter how much they want to do that, that the people feel differently. And so that's what I've been trying to do with my journalism at the Gray Zone Project. Uh, we've encountered a lot of resistance, a lot of attacks, and a lot of other people you've had on your show. And you yourself, I see you're getting called a Kremlin asset. And it's just <laughs> important to recognize that people are, that we're filling an important void here and that people are really listening because they're tired of, you know, they're tired of the crap they're getting from MSNBC and they're laughing at Rachel Maddow now. Oh, I, I, I hope so. She, you know, she's still the number one rated news person on all of cable. So uh, she, mean, that's, she did that's something. Sad. What's that? I mean, you have to look at also who she's speaking to. I mean, there's a lot of people, n no offense but to them, but like there's a lot of semi-retired people who don't have much to do and they just have the TV on. And, and very in the same way people like to go to scary movies or and ride roller coasters that's how people watch Rachel Maddow's show people like to be scared because it makes them it makes them feel more alive temporarily that's a fact that's why people are watching her show uh, I mean I don't know if that's a fact but people do like uh, but why that's why they're watching but people do go to scary movies and ride roller coasters because being scared makes them feel more alive and that's right. my theory that people are watching her show so they can be scared of Russia and Trump and this impending doom that coming. Last week, she said Russia could turn off all the power in our country and you would freeze to death in the middle of a polar vortex. She used the polar vortex to fear monger about Russia. That's the kind of crazy stuff you would find in wingnut magazines in the 80s before the internet was, I mean, but now she's doing it. The number one news show is just doing it at the top of her lungs. Good night and good luck. I, 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 that's stunning. It, it is, it is, I mean, to me, it really stunned me. I, I, I see even people on the left, I guess she's on the left, pushing Russiagate, but that, it had to expose the clownishness of the Russiagate narrative, did it not? And now we know who turned off the power at the prison in Brooklyn where prisoners have been freezing in the cold for days. It was Vladimir Putin. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just trying to divide us again.
No, I mean, she's deflect, obviously deflecting and distracting from serious issues that are taking place in the real world. And it's because you're right. Uh, there is a powerful ratings model that she's built. It started, you know, with the fever around Trump getting impeached over Russian collusion. And she had her viewers hooked every night. What's the next development? And Rachel Maddow was on top of it. What's going to come out next? Trump's going to be gone soon. And I don't know, Hillary Clinton will come in. And now it's like two years later, it's clearly not going to happen. And she's just, she's like on the island of Dr. Maddow. She's kind of like getting kind of crazier. Her, her, um, her, I watched her show uh, for a whole hour last week. And it wasn't the one where she did the crazy, Russia's going to turn our power off and Russia will freeze you. I watched a different show. And her whole show was about Russia. The whole thing was about spinning conspiracy theories about Russia, the same way Glenn Beck used to get his chalkboard out and he would do his whole show telling you that the Muslims were coming and right. there's a caliphate right. and there's Muslims here and Muslims there and that's why this means that and the Muslims, Muslims and then Obama. And she does the same thing without a chalkboard to use graphics and she goes, Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, Russians, Russians, Trump. She's doing the it's exact same thing except it's a mirror image on the left, is it not? Absolutely. And I always said this was like creeping Sharia for elite liberals. Um, you know, the Republicans had this idea of creeping Sharia that Muslims were implementing this secret campaign to impose theocratic law at the local levels across the country, that they were penetrating from within with uh, foreign backing. And now you have the same thing being said about the Russians, uh, that there's a fifth column. And uh, you know they're working with useful idiots like us, and you know Nazis on the right, and some kind of brown red alliance. And you know you also see the same kind of racist rhetoric. Uh, the New York Times published a piece two days ago that warned that lying is in the Russian DNA. Ah. We actually saw J James Clapper, the former uh, director of national intelligence, uh, make that statement on CNN as well that. Um, that it's in the Russian DNA to deceive. Uh, we even learned from the New York Times op-ed that there's a word in Russian for lying, who knew? Um, so this is the kind of, uh, I mean, imagine if they replaced Russians with Jews or Asians or yes, something. Yes, or Mexicans. Or Mexicans. So, you know, it's convenient for the Democrats uh, that there, there isn't some like, um, you know, interest group of Russians that are part of the Democratic constituency. So, you know, it's easy to bash them. And I'm not going to come out and defend the Russian government as being particularly progressive or an open society. But, you know, they'll pay the price and they're paying the price in terms of, uh, you know, the intermediate, the intermediate nuclear forces treaty being thrown away and then not, not being able to understand how dangerous this is, that it, there's going to be another nuclear arms race between the U.S. and Russia. And, and the Democrats provided Trump and John Bolton, who's been clamoring for throwing this important treaty away for years with all the cover they needed uh, through their Russiagate hysteria. That's why I I've been opposing it. And, and, and now I, you have, yeah, go Let ahead. me just tell you one, one more thing about the Rachel Maddow coverage. When she scared everybody about the Russia freezing us, they control our power grid. She was referencing the threat assessment that was published by the Director of National Intelligence. She never told right. us who the Director of National Intelligence was. She never said who that was. What she didn't do was she wasn't properly skeptical of the intelligence community in our own country. She was just repeating what the intelligence de national uh, uh, director said. She wasn't right. actually being applying journalistic skepticism to it, right? So right. she was just repeating right. it, and that's called being a stenographer to power, which is what she was doing. Because if she would have told her audience who the Director of National Intelligence is who was putting out this threat assessment set to warning us about China and Russia taking over our power grid, you know what she would have had to say? Well, that guy was uh, a WMD guy. He was the one who pushed WMDs in the United States. He threatened other countries to go along with us invading Iraq. And if we didn't, they, would have, they were going to pay a price for it. He's also the same guy who was against the Iran deal, the Iran nuclear deal, Dan Coats. She doesn't tell you that. It's amazing what Rachel Maddow won't tell you when a Trump appointee's view matches up with hers. Isn't that kind of interesting? No, that's what I, you know, we've been saying from the beginning is that from the beginning of this Russiagate saga, another danger is that the public and particularly, you know, liberals and progressives are supposed to take the intelligence community. It's like, 
not even a community. It's not like this Mensa club of guys who go out in the woods and consult with an Oracle and then, <laughs> you know, are, are geniuses. Um, but we're supposed to take the military intelligence apparatus at its word and accept everything that's said by anonymous officials because it's directed against Trump. And these are the same people that we didn't trust in the Bush era. So, so what, do you, what, what do you find people's response? Do you ever pose this question? Uh, hey, Trump is for a coup in Venezuela, Russia's against it. So either right. side of that, you're gonna be a Trump, uh, a Putin puppet, right? What are those, what do Russia gators say about this? Right. I mean, it's this simplistic dynamic that, well, if Putin is supporting the Venezuelan government, then, well, uh, you're on the side of Russia if you oppose intervention. Nobody ever talks about the fact that the African Union completely opposes it and has sent a message of solidarity to Nicolas Maduro. No one talks about the fact that every Caribbean nation except Haiti, um, because Haiti was a victim of another coup run by the US, opposes the intervention. No one talks about the fact that Italy and Austria also oppose it. And that uh, most of most Venezuelans, according to a poll by Interlaces, which we reported at, at the Gray Zone Project, over 80% oppose US intervention and sanctions because Eight, they 86, don't want- 86% was the number 86%. I saw. 86% of Venezuelans oppose US intervention in their country. Yeah, so they're all, I mean, guess their brains were all hacked by Putin. Yeah. Uh, either, that, either that or they don't want to live in another Libya style situation. That's what's but, coming to Venezuela. Libya is coming to Venezuela if we let it happen. And uh, just again, to all the idiot, uh, useful idiots for the CIA who have to, can't talk about Venezuela without repeating Vene CIA talking points that Maduro's a bad guy, the elections aren't free, the people want him gone. That's all propaganda. The elections were 100% above board. Maduro invited the UN to come monitor it. It was the opposition who didn't want the UN to come. Why would the opposition want the UN to come monitor it? Because if it was an illegal election and there was malfeasance happening, wouldn't you want the UN you in there to document it? Right, you you absolutely absolutely would, unless your goal was to delegitimize the democratic institutions of the Venezuelan state. The Carter Center has found that Venezuela's elections were, in their words, the freest and fairest in the world. Um, they didn't monitor the most recent elections. But another point worth making is that Henry Falcone ran against Maduro. He ran strongly against him. He was the only major opposition figure to run. And he was put under extreme pressure by the US not to run in the election because the US just sought to simply delegitimize the election and set the stage for this coup. Uh, just imagine if this took place in the US. I mean, just imagine if a, a more powerful foreign nation told American candidates that they couldn't run against Donald Trump uh, because they wanted to declare a parallel government. I mean, just imagine that. But what we should also know about Juan Guaido and his popular will party is that these figures were trained since they were students at private universities in Venezuela by the arms of the US government regime change organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy um, through a group called Otpor in Belgrade, which had been funded and trained by the US to overthrow Slobodan Milosevic in 1998. And they were trained ever since 2007 to implement a series of destabilization campaigns, including violent protests that took place in 2014 and 2017, and that they've been funded and supported by the US all along. They've been heavily involved in violence that's killed hundreds. Uh, they held Caracas basically under siege in 2016. And when people talk about opposition leaders being exiled or in jail, these are the people that were in Juan Guaido's popular will party who were actually directly involved in violent destabilization campaigns uh, called garimbas. Now just imagine if a foreign power like Russia or China was funding students in the United States to lead violent protests like black bloc style protests that actually managed to hold cities under siege. Um, how would the US government treat those figures? Just consider that for a second. And then consider the fact that as the New York Times reported yesterday, Juan Guaido is riding around freely around Venezuela in a motorcycle, making calls on his cell phone and riling up support for a coup. He hasn't been arrested. He hasn't been touched. Uh, what kind of dictatorship is that? Right, uh, very well put. Matt, uh, Max, can you, where, where would you recommend besides Venezuelan analysis, 
uh, com. Where, where do you do you see any good reporting of Venezuela happening in the United States? Yeah, I mean, there are a few places. I would say definitely pay a visit to grayzoneproject.com. Um, we've been doing a lot of reporting on this, a lot of deep reporting, but we also have daily reports uh, by Ben Norton. Um, you know, you can follow me at Max Blumenthal on Twitter. Definitely follow Benjamin Norton at Benjamin Norton on Twitter. Um, I, I look at Telesor as a site that produces reporting in English from the other side, which is the side of the left wing governments in Latin America. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, if, if you want good background on this, watch Abby Martin's series from Venezuela, where she punctures a lot of the myths, um, through the empire files. I think that's, there's good background there. And there are also great books. Uh, George Chicarello Mar, who you cited before has written a really good book on Venezuela, um, and watch our Moderate Rebels podcast, where we interview uh, Professor Alina Piva from Caracas about the situation right now and what it's like being in Caracas at this time. It's a lot different than you might think it, it is if you watch mainstream media and they make it out to be this kind of dystopia where everybody's starving in the streets. Right. Yeah, it's well, not I, what's happening. That's not what's not what's happening. Life is actually going along uh, uh, pretty close to normal. And uh, no one's starving, no one's breaking into zoos to eat anim zoo animals to live. That's not happening. But um, uh, Max, thank you very much from the Gray Zone Project. Thanks for that video. That was fantastic. And we look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks, pal. Thanks for having me. And sorry about the curtain situation. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right. You look like Kinda a villain. <laughs> All right. Hey, guys. We hope you enjoy this free clip of Aggressive Progressives on the Young Turks. This is just a preview of what you will receive with TYT membership. That means exclusive interviews, panel discussions, and more of Jimmy, and of course, me. If you like what you saw, you can access full episodes of Aggressive Progressives by becoming a member. Head to tyt.com join now.